Hi, everybody. Welcome to tonight's AHSS Presents, A Conversation with Grady Hendricks. I'm Tiffany Angus. A little bit of housekeeping before we get going. Um, so uh, this is being recorded. So later on during the major Q&A at the end, if you want to show yourself on camera, just know that you're going to be recorded. Um, but we are going to leave the chat open during the talk. So if you have questions that maybe are related to what we're talking about, go ahead and pop them in there. I'll take a look every now and then. Grady will probably look every now and then. He might answer some of those as we go. But do know there will be a dedicated good 10 minutes at least at the end for, for questions and answers. Um, so Grady Hendricks, uh, he's been a journalist for over a decade, but is most well known for his best-selling horror novels. Uh, he started with Horror Store in 2014 about a haunted Ikea, um, which uh, was followed by My Best Friend's Exorcism. I have a copy right here. That's what it looks like. Um, the only horror novel I've ever cried at the end of. I don't know if that's a good sell or not. Uh, that was followed by my, the Southern Book Club's Guide to Slaying Vampires in 2020, and his most recent bestseller, The Final Girl Support Group in 2021, about a group of women who are all the final girl um, from a serial killer's rampage who have their own support group and uh, things start going bad. They start disappearing. Um, all of these titles have been optioned for TV or film, so you might be seeing them on a screen sometime soon. He's also written for film, and he's still writing nonfiction. In 2017, Paperbacks from Hell, uh, The Twisted History of 70s and 80s Horror Fiction came out. And all this brings us to the title of the talk. So Grady, the first thing I'm sure everybody's really curious about, just what is a Nazi leprechaun? Yeah, um, well, this is a Nazi leprechaun. Um, <clears throat> they, uh, can, you, can you see them pretty well? Mm -hmm. Are yes. they beautiful? Yeah, yes. um, of course. Um, who, who doesn't love Nazis and who doesn't love leprechauns? And when you put them together, it's like the Reese's peanut butter cup, you know, of the horror family. Um, they are the star of a John Christopher novel called The Little People from <coughs> 1970, I think, 69, somewhere in there. And um, basically, you know, this, this secretary inherits this large Irish castle that you see there in the background in that beautiful Hector Garrido uh, cover. And um, she decides to turn it into a B&B, &B, which is you know, as you do. And, um, and it turns out it's absolutely crawling with Nazi leprechauns on opening weekend, which is terrible. But I do want to point out for accuracy's sake, they are not technically Nazi leprechauns. They are homunculi that have been created from the fetuses of Jewish concentration camp victims who were bred to be s and prostitutes, I guess, although they don't get paid, and work in sex clubs for full-size Gestapo officers during the war. And then when the war ended, of course, they were seeking further employment and sailed to Ireland, where they fight their enemies, uh, the rats. Um, and, and so, yeah, and that's a book I, I stumbled across a long time ago. Um, and I wasn't really writing horror at the time. And um, I read it and I wrote about it online and I started writing about other horror novels of that ilk. And it took me down this rabbit hole of um, writing about horror, not just writing horror, but writing about horror and other books and things like that. And it was sort of this accidental voyage that wound up at some point, I was doing this all for tour.com. And um, at the time, Tor paid $25 a post, which I was pretty broke. And so if I did like four posts a month, that was like my grocery money. And so I was always looking for stuff to write for them. That seemed like a good idea, wrote more. And then eventually my editor said, you know, have you ever thought about writing a book of those essays about weird horror paperbacks? And I said, no. And he said, well, yeah, I don't think we'd publish it, but do me a pitch. Just, you know, maybe we would, I'd like to read it. So I did them a pitch and they bought it, which turned into Paperbacks from Hell, which really, which is a history of the horror paperback boom in the seventies and eighties. And that really has become this weird thing in my life um, that did a lot for me professionally, I guess. But more than that, um, it, it sort of took me to this road where I was reading books that I'd be a lot poorer if I hadn't read. I mean, the Shadow Knows, I never would have read by Diane Johnson, who is a straight novelist. Uh, she does literary fiction, but she wrote this book about this woman being stalked over the phone that's 
amazing. My my life would not be my life without having read this book. And actually, it, it's it's so good that it convinced Stanley Kubrick to uh, hire her to write the screenplay for The Shining. Um, I and and the other one that was in there was uh, When Darkness Loves Us by Elizabeth Engstrom, and it was out of print at the time and. It's an amazing book. It's two novellas that were published together in the early 80s with a great Jill Bauman cover there. Um, and when I put that, when I read it, I hadn't read a good one of these books in a long time. I was writing paperbacks from hell. I was reading three to four books a day to sort of get the book done. And, um, and this was the first good one I read in about eight or nine books. And it was really fantastic. It was exactly what I needed, a, bo a book about underground incest monsters. And, um, and, after that, this small press called Valencourt got in touch with me and um, they were like, oh, we're thinking of doing a reprint line. And I'd written an intro or two for them for some other books. And they usually reprint out of print stuff. And they were like, would you want to do a paper action hell one? And I was like, yeah, sure, why not? And so that kind of resulted in all these, which are sort of part of the reprint line, but everywhere from, from Lisa Tuttle's uh, Nest of Nightmares, which never got published in the States, even though she's an American writer, to When Darkness Loves Us. And the thing that's been nice about this is um, getting these books back into print that I think are amazing, or like The Nest, which is about cockroaches that eat people's buttholes. Maybe not an amazing book, but a really fun one. Um, and not just doing that, but the authors are like, holy crap, I'm getting royalties again. What the what the hell? And we're paying the original artist to you know to to reuse their art, and and everyone's getting paid. And it's been really nice. It's actually been kind of the most gratifying thing in my career, uh, which I guess I got a low bar. Um, but yeah, so I mean, so that was just sort of this accidental process of stumbling from one thing to another. And, and you just sort of follow it. And that's why I always get nervous when people are like, oh, you know, how'd you become a writer? And I'm like, yeah, mostly by accident. Yeah, accident. So, so yeah, that word accidental, I think is really key here because quite often, um, and, and I teach newer writers, um, quite often, you know, they have this plan, like here's how this is going to work out. But I, I know that the path you followed was different. So, you know, can you describe a bit about that accidental path and how yeah. you happened? organically in some ways to becoming a horror writer, basically. Yeah, well, there's sort of two things here. I mean, one is that when you're younger, maybe not even when you're younger, maybe when you're older too, I don't know. I'm not young anymore. But like, you think that things happen because of you, like you're gonna do this, you're gonna do that. And whatever it is, let's say you're like, I am going to become a chartered accountant. I'm gonna do this. Well, then you fall in love and then there's a baby and then the baby's sick and then, your wife has to move somewhere, or your husband, or whoever. I mean, like, it's just a chain of things that are accidents. So when people are like, how'd you become a writer? I'm like, by mistake. Um, and, and so, but I realize when I think about it, like, cause that's kind of a cop-out answer as well. It's like people saying, where'd you get your ideas? And writers go, oh, from the idea store. Oh, what a silly question. It's like, it's actually not a silly question. Sort of the only question. Um, so how did I become a writer? I basically painted myself into a corner and, I either did that accidentally because I'm dumb or I did that and life happens or I did that on purpose because I was too nervous and shy about what I actually wanted to do. And so just decided to slowly sabotage myself until it was the only thing I could do. But uh, I originally started out wanting to be a director and not just like a director, director, but like a theater director. So in universe, in high school and university, I did a lot of theater. And, um, <laughs> and, and it was, it was really um, wacky. Um, I was really into experimental theater. And um, uh, it was, it was pretty, it, it was fun actually, um, but it really got me in a lot of trouble. And, um, and I also realized I was spending all my time um, making sure people showed up for rehearsal and memorized their lines, which wasn't fun. So I needed to do something that would um, require only me. And I realized that that was writing because writing is the loneliest uh, art form because it's just you, you sad sack. Like you, you don't have any friends. You can't form a football team. You like, you can't get someone to sit for your painting to be your model. You suck, uh, go write a book. But I didn't even want to write books at the time. I was just like writing, I guess, because it was something I did kind of proficiently and I kind of kept doing it. And um, I lived in Hong Kong for a little while and I moved back to the States and I, I was married at the time. I still am, but like, 
And um, I wound up working, I answered a Craigslist ad for an office manager. And I went up and it turned out to be an office manager for a psychic research lab. So I was there for like five years. Yeah, it was, it was fun. It was really fun. It was, it was a place founded by William James back in like 1885. It was a nonprofit. They had a great archive and um, it was, it was a really fabulous education. Um, and uh, I answered the phones mostly. It's actually the place Ghostbusters is based on. Uh, Dan Aykroyd and his dad and his brother are all members. And his original script of Ghostbusters is based on this place. Um, but, but very different. We, we had a much less exciting life. And, um, and at some point in there, I had started writing for fanzines and online just for free because I really love Hong Kong movies. I lived there for a little while. My wife and I had sort of like fallen in love with them because when we went to university, there was a, the last Chinese movie theater in North America was around the corner from us and it was six bucks for a double feature. So we just kept going and we kind of like wound up loving it. So then we were like moved to Hong Kong and I sold chemicals, like cleaning chemicals. It was a terrible job. I had to weigh garbage. It was weird. Um, <laughs> but when we moved back to the States, I was like, oh, I want to, you know, there were all these fanzines because it was the 90s and that's what people did. So I was writing about different Hong Kong movies because I had this like tiny bit of knowledge about them. And I pretended like it was a lot. And I was doing that more and more and more. And, and I lucked into this gig writing a couple of pieces for Playboy. Um, I, okay, I'll try to keep this part of the story short, but I made a documentary with two friends of mine um, called Confederacy Theory um, this summer I got back from Hong Kong because I'm from South Carolina and at the time which was 98, 99, South Carolina still flew the Confederate flag over the state house so me and these friends, this friend of mine had this idea to make a movie, a documentary about the Confederate flag so the three of us rode around, we did this documentary, we sold it to PBS, yay yay, all very good, I mean didn't see any money from it but there you go, it's PBS. Um, and uh, and then another friend of mine was being a writer and she was working for Arthur Frommer's Budget Travel, which is like this discount travel. It's like, you know, where's the Nicholas Hurricane been? Puerto Rico, we can get you some great hotel deals in Puerto Rico. It was basically like this, this travel the world on the cheap because you're going places where everyone just died um, and they have no tourist industry right now. Um, and so, Every year, Richard Branson does a, 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 a gag, a prank for either his birthday or April Fool's Day. I can never, I think it's April Fool's Day. The virgin guy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so he had hired these friends of mine who were all these like Harvard lampoon people, these friends of friends of mine, I, I don't know Harvard people, um, to do a fake version of the New York Times that was going to come out on whatever prank day was for Richard Branson, like oh, 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 billionaire humor. And um, so my friend was like, well, you're funny. Um, and she and I had gone to high school together and been voted wittiest. So clearly there was evidence that I was funny. And um, she was like, why don't you work on this? So I was like, uh, and there's all these Harvard Lampoon people. In the it was all these like really, high, they're all gonna, we're gonna work on Saturday Night Live and I'm a writer for the Tonight Show and I'm an interning in David Letterman's, you know, bathroom and, you know, in his fourth vacation home. And it was like really high powered stuff. And what happened was, they were all lazy. And like everyone just would rather like go drinking and get fucked up. And so I just sort of put my head down. I wound up writing something like 18 articles for that thing. I was doing like editorial cartoons. I was, I was being the photo editor, it was ridiculous. And so at the big rap part, and actually the guy who masterminded that has gone on to be a really incredibly good writer about Asian film. He did a great movie on Shaolin Monastery, or a great book on Shaolin Monastery, and probably the only really good a biography of Bruce Lee. Uh, his name's Matthew Polly. And if you're interested in Bruce Lee, his biography is great. It's called Bruce Lee, a biography, easy to find. Anyways, so I go to this party at the end of this where everyone continues their drinking. And I meet this really old dude who turns out to be the nonfiction editor at Playboy. And I'm telling you about this Confederate flag documentary. And he's like, ah, oh, you should write that for us. And I was like, oh. Mm -hmm. um, and so he's like, send me a proposal. So I didn't know what I was doing. So I faxed over like this, thousand word thing about what the article would be and he's like this is great we're gonna run this so he just ran the proposal um and so suddenly i had i was working for these psychics and i had a clip in playboy and then you can go to other places and be like i've written for many publications like playboy here you go and then you get other work and as i slowly did that eventually a friend of mine couldn't handle a gig they had they were too overcommitted reviewing a movie i wound up reviewing it for him 
And then I was a freelancer for like 10 years when you could make that kind of money doing really, really well. Um, freelance writing, like cultural coverage. And now people just get some poor intern in the newsroom to do it. But back then you, they paid you money. Um, and it actually took me a really long time till I was making money that good again when I was writing fiction. I was doing that. And then 2008 hit financial crisis and it went poorly. And so I, um, I decided to double down on writing fiction. And I went to this thing called Clarion Science Fiction Fantasy Writers Workshop uh, with Tiffany um, in 2009. And it really changed my life. And I got really serious about writing fiction again. And it was probably the best thing I've ever done consciously with a plan. And after that, it was just writing, you know, and writing, writing. It took me many years. I, my wife was working and supporting us. I was bringing in real money. But it took me a long time. And I, I co-wrote a cookbook with my wife. It's a graphic novel. I co-wrote some YA with a friend. I self-published some stuff and eventually lucked into a contract for horror score, this horror novel about a haunted Ikea in like 2014. And for anyone out there who is old like I am, um, that wasn't until I was well past 40 that I landed horror store. Um, so yeah, so it's like, People who feel like, because I felt like I was wasting my life in my 20s, and I was, but I was having a life. Um, but like, dude, it takes the time it takes, you know, it happens. Well, I mean, I that read was, a thing that said- I can't, can't believe, like, why didn't I just go back to like, and then my grandmother comes from Latvia. That was really long. I apologize. <laughs> no, no, it was great. Because, I mean, I think sometimes what we need to hear is that is that story of the progression, because- again, we have this idea of I'm going to do this and write this and write this, and then it'll be, it. then it'll be it. And I remember you and I talking at Clarion, you know, 13 years ago, again, cool. math. I remember you and I talking about the, the legend of Clarion that like a third of the people there won't ever write again. A third of the people there are just kind of like carry on and a third, and then like a third will make it, you know, we were just, just right. like, just trying to decide like who was going to be who. Um, and so were we right? Uh, you, I thought I said you were going to make it, and I think I was totally right. Obviously, yeah. Um, so there's one thing that seems to come out from that story is um, being in the right place, maybe not necessarily at the right yeah. time, but putting yourself out there, saying, "Yeah, I'm going to go for it. I'm going to try to talk to this person and see what happens." Yeah, and and a lot of that's because I don't shut up. Uh, so I'm not <laughs> shy about talking, but also they're just things that you do, like. I've interviewed people a ton in my life. Um, and I, I, you know, and I really realized that like, you just talk to people, um, you know, and, and it really works. And, you know, doing that Confederate flag documentary, I mean, half, I would say two thirds of the people we talked to were, were people whose politics and mine weren't aligned. I mean, um, people with SS lightning bolts tattooed on their arms, people who tried to explain to me very carefully that the Holocaust didn't happen. David Irving, a famous British historian, who's a famous Holocaust denier. Um, and, and then the others, they were often people from really different walks of life than me. And it just, one of the interesting things about that documentary is I, we discovered all three of us that the less politically aligned we were with people, the more, the easier they were to get along with, and the more people agreed with our politics, God, the bigger pains in the ass they were. <laughs> um, but yeah, and so it's just, you know, the, the thing is, if you're gonna write books, you gotta go where people write books, you know? Like, you gotta, if you're gonna write movies, you should probably move to LA. Like, you know, if you're gonna write books, you need to be in London or New York or somewhere where there's a publishing industry, you know? it's you have to be around the people who are doing what you do because you're going to take on their lives, lives a little bit. And, you know, there's a saying in freelancing that um, you can have two of three things. You can have it fast, good, or cheap, right? You can have it fast and cheap, but it won't be good. You can have it good and cheap, but it won't be fast. You can have it good and fast, but it won't be cheap. And I've always found that's true. Um, and it's true in the reverse. Like I can do something well and fast if I'm getting paid a lot of money, but I can do it poorly, but cheaply if, if I got, I've got a lot of time. You know, it's like you get those variables and, and they work for you. But the other thing I discovered is you have to be someone people can get along with. Um, you have to be able to take criticism without defending yourself. Clarion was great at that because oh, yeah. you just sat there for the crits, right? And it went around yeah. the table and everyone told you why your story sucked and you couldn't say anything. 
Um, and I've actually covered, you know, Tim, you and I talked about this at Clarion because there was the two models, right? The one where the whole room would critique your story and then you got to say your piece at the end. And then there was the model, and I can't remember where you came down at, where the whole room got to say their piece and you just shut up at the end, which. No, I just remember there was the first one, which we call the, Mil well, we here we call it the Milford method, where, yeah, you go around the room and whoever's in the hot seat is quiet. But then there was that shift where, um, like, Paul Park took over and walked around talking about the story and nobody yeah. else really got to talk. Um, so, and I don't think I, I don't think we talked after that one. I don't think the hot seat got to see much after that. Yeah, well, no, I guess to me, yeah, there was also someone who talked about there had been a teacher, maybe not our year, who like you weren't allowed to like defend your story or say what you were trying to do. And I actually like kind of come around to that. Like, I'm like, that's that's not a bad thing. And especially as a dude to learn to just shut up sometimes and listen to what other people have to say. It's a valuable life lesson. But to me, that's the thing though. You've got to be someone people want to spend time with and work with. You've got to be able to take criticism. You've got to be able to see the part. I've never gotten a bad note in my life. I've never gotten a bad note in my life um, because there's always a note behind there that I need to understand. And so you, you have to build that. You have to be friendly. You have to have interesting crap to say because everyone's socially awkward. Not just it's not just you, and I don't mean you in particular. I mean you in general. Um, like. Because then editors, if they're like, oh, well, there's that one guy, but he's so painful. Oh, and then there's someone who's like super friendly and will just say, cool, like, and maybe tell me a funny story about his, his, you know, lobster. Like, you know what I mean? It's like, it becomes a choice. There's a lot of, and you know, people say social engineering, networking. I feel like that's people trying to uh, medicalize what is a basic social interaction. You just want to be nice to people because people will remember how you make them feel and if, if mm -hmm. yeah like if you're if you're looking for somebody to to give a, like a um like a piece of writing to and you remember like person a made you feel really good they might not be the most dynamic writer in the world but you can work with them you know they're they can yeah. hit deadlines etc they can take notes and that other person who you know could like write this amazing thing but they're just oh, there's just so many there's just it's just such a bad personality clash. You're gonna remember how those people make you feel. So, yeah, so. exactly. Yeah, it's just normal human behavior. Like no one is an editor. They're Tiffany who had a day and she's gonna go home. And like, there's no such thing as an editor. There's just a person, you know? It's, yeah. Yeah. it's, it's easy to forget because it's exhausting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so you talked about networking, important to networking, being in certain places, et cetera. But how did you end up accidentally, accidentally on purpose, writing horror? How did you stumble into that? So yeah, so that was, I always wrote weird stuff and I always like, maybe it leaned a little dark, like, but I was never a big horror kid. The book covers scared me too much as a kid. I mean, you know, your country, like, you know, that's, <laughs> as a little kid, that was terrifying to me. And it's weird to me. I just have that line around in this place. Um, and what I realized was that the more my stuff leaned into horror, the more people liked it. Um, and I was like, okay, well, I can work with that. I like horror. I didn't know a ton about it. I'd watched movies all my life. I'd read Stephen King and Clive Barker and all that, and Shirley Jackson, sure. But like, I wasn't hugely versed in it. Um, but I also realized, and this was the, probably the 2000s, I guess, when we were clearing there was a huge hole in the market. Not many people were doing horror. Um, it just was and not. Fashion. Yeah, it had really fallen out of fashion and, and deservedly so. Horror had really become its own worst enemy in the 90s. Um, and and people, people often say like, like when I told my mom I got a book contract for horror store, she was like, yay. And I was like, it's for a horror novel. And it was like, the light just died. It was like, <laughs> my son's gonna write pornography. Um, and actually, I think she would have been happier with the pornography, but like horror did get a reputation. And this is really a 90s thing as being this sort of like gore porn. And it was, it was, it was the 90s was a time when horror got really ugly, especially literary horror. It got super misogynistic. It got super gory, super porny. And there were a lot of reasons for that, but it happened. Um, and so it really has taken a long time to wash that stink off. Um, but, but you know, we, we rolled around in the poop. We can't blame someone for putting the poop in our bed. Um, and 
so, so I realized I was sort of doubling down on horror, but also there was this opportunity. There weren't a lot of people to tell me what it was. And there were a lot of like, you could do things that felt new. Um, and then I did a thing that, so one of the things that, that I, and this sounds so dumb, right? Like, and, and if anyone's listening to this and this is the moment where you log off, you have my blessing because it sucks to have a dude with money in his bank account and health insurance while you guys all have the NIH, NHI, whatever, uh, NIH, whatever, whatever you have. What do you have? NIH? NHS. Yes. Yeah. NHS. Thank you. Jesus Christ. Like <laughs> for the time being, you got it. Um, but like, but like for a dude who has health insurance and money in the bank and an apartment and all this stuff to be like, follow your enthusiasms. It sounds like such horse shit. Um, but everything people said to me when I was starting out that I thought was horse shit, like follow your enthusiasms or write what you know and all that turned out to be true. And those have actually turned out to be the more profound things. I just had to come around to them on my own. Um, and one of the things is I've always sort of like, you know, listen, I've been stony, man. I've, I've been looking for money in old pants to buy food. Like, you know, I'm not gonna starve to death or anything, but like, like, like the point where it's like, there's rice in the cabinets and tuna. And you know, it's not, it's not yeah. good. Um, and always, I've only been able to work if I really was excited about something. And I'm an excitable person, so that's not hard. But all the stuff I did that seemed like way too much effort. Oh my God, this is not worth the paycheck. So one of the things early on I did with tour, and those are the things that have really stood me in good stead. So a thing I did early on with tour, 25 bucks a pop was a Stephen King reread. Because so I was like, you know what? I remember that. Yeah, and I was like, because I'm going to tell them I'm going to read the first 10 books, and that's $250. You know, I'm going to do them in order. I'm going to write about them. I'm going to do the research. And I was like, that's that's 250. That's like, that's like two months. That's probably like a month and a half of reading, two months of reading, and then two months, that's like 250 over like three or four months. That's like a nice, steady, guaranteed thing. I, I'm good with that. And it was a lot more worth than anticipating. I wound up doing all the books pretty much. I did like 39 of them or something over the course of like four years, five years. And it's something that people really enjoy. And I'm really proud of the, the doing that. Um, but one of the things with that is that, um, when I started doing that, I was just about to, unbeknownst to me, probably like three months in the future, sign this contract for Horror Store. And by the time I finished that, four or five years later, I just won the Stoker Award for Paperbacks from Hell. And so it was this like four or five year period of enormous change for me, like a lot of upheaval, a lot of craziness. And the one consistent thing was reading these really big fat books by Stephen King. And I developed this little like Stephen King that like sat on my shoulder. He's probably has nothing to do with it. I heard the real dude getting interviewed recently. He sounds nothing like my dude. <laughs> um, I prefer my dude, but it really got me through some hard times because I didn't have an agent for my first four books. You know, I just couldn't get one. And I was like, oh, Stephen King didn't have an agent for his first one. He seemed to have done okay. Um, I had some real conflicts with my publisher. And then I looked at how King's first publisher, and I was like, okay, they were, they were just, and, and I'd be like, okay, so, you know, it was just stuff that got me through and sort of like stuff I needed to hear, um, you know, like to, to sort of like, don't keep doing the same thing over and over, you know, always try to do something new, stuff like that. I only heard it because I had little, little homunculus Stephen King on my shoulder from writing that thing that was free, but that's what got me through. So it's, yeah, you wind up in these accidental things. The, the idea of like writing what really excites you is such a great piece of advice, though, because quite often we get stuck in this idea of thinking, OK, here I have this idea for a book and it'll do this or that or the other for a reader. And you start writing it and you're it's hard. I mean, all writing is hard, but it's particularly hard and it's boring. Yeah. And all that's going to do is bore whoever's reading it. And so one thing I think of it, and I tell my students this, and, and you can tell them this as well, is like, write just that weird thing in your head, because there are going to be other weird readers out there who want that story. They need that weirdness. They need oh, whatever yeah. banana pants thing you're come up with. Um, yeah. And so for you, you know, you wrote about 100 Ikea, you wrote Horror Store, and then you kind of went down the line of, of becoming the new horror writer, you know, the pendulum swinging back and horror is becoming a going concern again. And you're part of that. But one thing that you've done that's really interesting is so many of your, 
all of your protagonists are women. Like, yeah, that's, well, a whole, so, that's a whole new thing. So tell us about that. Well, there were two things with that. One is that um, it was practical. I really can't write about someone who looks like me because then they just wind up being like enormously handsome and like sexually <laughs> potent. And, you know, that gets tiresome for the reader. And then they're like, why, why isn't everyone just like listening to this guy in this book and doing exactly what he says? He's so charismatic. Um, so I have to have some distance uh, or else I write really boring stuff. And so one of the easiest ways to do that is to just have the character be a different gender than I am. Um, and as people started asking, I think it was after I did my second book, Best Friends Exorcism, people were like, oh, you write about women and all this. And I was like, well, yeah. And so then I started, and by then I was really learning more about horror and all this. And I really then justify what I did because I really do sincerely feel that horror is mostly a woman genre. Um, if you think of like, I mean, and, and listen, you can't gender literature, right? Like it, books are books, anyone can write them. But if you're gonna gender it just for fun, because we're all drinking, um, you know, men's adventure fiction. Well, it says men right there, you know, action adventure. I'm not saying women can't write it, but usually it's written by, by men. Uh, romance novels are more often than not written by women. Um, you know, spy thrillers, more often dudes. Uh, female friendship books, more often women. Um, so, and I feel like horror is really a woman genre. I mean, the one book we still read, the oldest horror novel we still read for, for fun today is Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. Um, Anne Radcliffe was probably the most successful writer of the late 18th century writing Gothic horror. Um, most, even though they're the big names in the 19th century, like, like Bram Stoker and uh, Robert Louis Stevenson, um, most of the ghost stories, uh, Charles Dickens, most ghost stories and the real shape of the genre was determined by women in the 19th century. Um, women like Mary Wilkins Freeman and uh, uh, Oliphant and uh, a, a bunch of women, um, and my names are eluding me, sorry, um, but who were writing short stories and, and publishing that really shape of the genre is. And then, you know, the two major, I think, horror novels of the 20th century, The Haunting of Hill House and Beloved, were both written by women. Um, and you know, people are like, well, it's a man genre, Stephen King and Clive Barker and Dean Koontz. And I would say, yeah, but when they were writing, the other two people who had any stature approximating Kings were Anne Rice and V.C. Andrews. Um, and if you don't think V.C. Andrews writes horror, I don't know what's going on in your house. Um, I, I, I read them all when I was a kid. I mean, they were- They're great. Uh, and and it, they're one of those, it's one of those set of books. It's one of those authors that a lot of people don't know about now. And then I, I just wonder what parents like people who haven't come across it, if they read it and then thought 13 year old girls used to read this, like it would be terrifying for them. Yeah. Well, and you know, it was always interesting 13 year old boys because we knew they had sex in them. So it was like, they get passed around. I remember, I remember going to the national boy scout jamboree or cub scout jamboree, whatever, I think it was 12 or 13. And on the bus to DC, we were all reading, I think it was the second, uh, no, it was, um, yeah, there will be thorns, if there be thorns, whatever the second uh, flowers they had, because it had like racy parts. Um, <laughs> but so, yeah, so anyway, so I justified my characters being women later, but really it was a really practical consideration. I needed main characters who were different from me. So, so what does it mean now when people say you're, you know, like a feminist horror writer, that you write feminist horror books? I don't know. I mean, that's really in the eye of the beholder. And like, I, I feel like, um, I feel like it's so creepy when a dude's like, I'm a feminist. Cause I feel like that's right before they put a roofie in your drink. Um, <laughs> so like, I, I get nervous around that talk. Um, um, at the same time, I hate people who would be like, I'm not a feminist. I'm like, well, <laughs> that's kind of creepy, really. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I really feel like, like I, almost never read a review of anything I've written. Um, like the New York Times, sure. Um, but really, I avoid it. I don't, I don't look at any of that stuff just because I, I know what's wrong with my books. Like I know where the problems are. I know where I need to be better and what I need to fix. And so all they're gonna do is either give me a big head or make me angry. Um, I like winning awards, that's fun. Um, but like, um, I just, I stay away from all that. So if people want to say that, great, good. I don't need to say that. I just need to write them. So, so do you see, so maybe not so much that, that label of being a feminist, you know, like, a, like writing feminist horror books, but 
do you see how what you've done shows it like there's something new to say about the genre because it's one of those genres mm. the pendulum swings back and forth and now right. it's come back and like it's changed now and you're part of that change yeah I mean well yeah but also like you know, so many of these things that seem macrocosmic, like the genre change are, are so microcosmic. You know what I mean? Like, like yeah. I've got, I just, I'm getting ready to do two more books with Berkeley, my, my new publisher. And um, getting these two books nailed down is like, it was so much horse trading. Well, what if we did this one? And then that, what if I got an extra time? And so it's like, by the time they get there, I'm like, was there any design here? Like, what was I doing? Now I've got to make this work. But you know, there are things they want from me. They want books about women. They don't want me writing about dudes. Um, and, and I get it, you know, that's what people seem to like. Um, they want them to be horror. They would love for them to be more pop culture-y, you know, like like everyone does because they feel like, like listen, I never sold rights the way I sold I, uh, horror store rights, like foreign rights. Holy cow, man. I sold so many foreign territories. I got more money from Germany than I got from the United States in terms of, I got like a factor of five times the advance in Germany I got in the States for horror store. I was like, yeah. And then my best friend's exorcism came out and sold two foreign territories because everyone speaks Ikea. Everyone knows what Ikea yeah. is. And, and so then, you know, you're sitting there talking to editors like, well, what if we found something? And it's like, well, we can't find that again. That, that was sort of this lucky lightning strike. And to try to manufacture it, I also just don't want to do the same thing over and over. So like the next book I'm writing, I'm, the book's coming out now, I'm terrified about. It's coming out this summer um, that I just turned in yesterday, or no, this morning at 9 a.m. Um, but I'm terrified about it. I, I think it's, I, uh, and then the book after that, I don't know how the fuck I'm going to pull it off. Um, <laughs> but that's sort of the thing about not being boring. As long as I'm entertained, maybe other people will be, oh. Yeah. yeah, but yeah let me, go ahead. No, I was going to say, like, lightning in a bottle, it could happen again, but if you try to plan for it, then things become, it's like putting together Lego, it becomes very rote and you're trying not to, yeah. not to follow that, not to, not to be pigeonholed that way. Yeah, and it's also like this whole thing about being a brand. Like there are things I do that I do very consciously. Like I, I do live shows instead of author events um, where it's like a one man show. Like I'm, I'm gonna start putting the one together for the next book, which is called How to Sell a Haunted House. So it's gonna be all about haunted houses. Um, and so like, that's part of what I do. Uh, I send out fun mailings now. Like I did um, for Final Girl Support Group. I, I, I finally have some extra money in the bank. So I was like, hey, I did trading cards for them. They went out and like foil wrappers to all these bookstores and libraries. And now I'm doing Valentine's Day cards for all of them for the next book. And um, it's fun to have some extra money to do stuff like that. Um, being really accessible, all that stuff is part of my like brand, but it's also how I like to do it. And it's also there's a real difference between writing the book and promoting the book. Those are two radically different worlds that require radically different skill sets. And so when I'm actually writing the book, um, which to me, we'll, we'll get to that in a second, but, but like when I'm writing the book, I try to sort of like drive, like kind of with my eyes closed because I don't <laughs> want to be too conscious of what I'm doing, if that makes sense. Like well, I'm being Grady Hendrix. Hmm. I'm it, writing the book. Yeah. It's like, if I walk up the stairs and I pay attention to my feet, I fall. It's yeah, exactly. Thing. Just do it on autopilot. So, okay, so you wanted to be a writer. You stumbled into being a horror writer whose books mainly star female protagonists and has something to say about the genre, blah, blah, blah. So somewhere between a plan and a surprise. You wanted to be a writer, ta-da, you're a horror writer. So, and you you said brand. So let's let's like unpack that a little bit. Like what other things have happened in your career that have been surprising or things that like, you learn that maybe you wish you'd known earlier, you know, the, the nuts and bolts oh. and the, the businessy stuff of it. Yeah, well, the nuts and bolts, you know, it's interesting. Like I, there's, there's nuts and bolts stuff that I really, um, some of it's easy, like pay attention. You know, like I, when I meet people, I try to write down their names, like all that stuff. People like it when you remember their names. So it's like, I know when I go to, Asheville, you know, there's three or four people who usually come to my events and, and they're going to feel really miffed if I'm like, uh, remind me of your name again. Like, it's just a nice thing to do. Um, but that's just like, to me, that's like a common sense. I was one of those creepy little kids who had to put on a coat and tie to get on an airplane because my parents thought it was like proper that way. Um, but like, there's also this real nuts and bolts publishing stuff. Like, you know, one of the things that I think 
really like people don't do enough is talk about the business of this. Like you should know what an advance is gonna look like. I mean, you should know basic things about commissions. If I wish I'd known about commissions, like the, the percentage you pay your agent or your manager or your lawyer or whatever earlier, like, because it really, cause you know, the thing I learned from watching a friend of mine's career um, is the agent, your agent always gets their commission. Your agent is always gonna get paid. You may not, they are always gonna get paid. And, and that's a real weird thing. Um, I didn't have an agent for my first four books. I couldn't get one. I had this horror store contract, for, I think $15,000 advance. Um, and, uh, it, and, and the, the publisher retained all rights, but split them with me 50-50, which is not a great deal. Um, because just word, word to everyone out there, hold on to as many rights as you can, everything you can hold on to, hold on to. I didn't for a lot of books because that just wasn't the deal on the table. I was able to negotiate it very well in my favor, but I couldn't hold the rights. And it still kicks my ass to this day. Um, and, but like, so I had this contract and I went to all these agents and like, they wouldn't even return my emails because to them, what are they going to get? They're going to get 15% on $15,000. What's that? That's oh, 2000 bucks, a little under. Uh, 15, seven, that's 1,575 bucks. Yeah. It's not worth their time. Like, and, and I couldn't get anyone. And then my contract just sort of like that book did well. So then, Hey, you want to do two more? And there was a lot of horse trading with my publisher. And I realized that I just didn't have the juice to get an agent who was going to do me any good. But one of the things that did do is by the time I got an agent after book four, um, is I had the juice not only to get a good agent, um, who was like, oh, there's actually a career here to manage. There's actually, I've got a job here and work to do, but I had a lot of moral authority because your agent often these days serves as one of your first readers, something the editor used to do, which is read your early drafts and yeah. really go back and forth with you. A lot of editors just don't have time. There's not enough people on staff and they're, they'll send you an edit letter and that's it. I insist on a lot of communication. I'm at a point where I can. And my first editor was a guy who liked a lot of communication, uh, Jason Rakulik. So like that worked out well for me, but like, but your agent is going to shape a lot of what you write. And oftentimes that's a great thing. Like they've got good instincts. They're not an agent for nothing, but having four books that had done relatively well under my belt gave me the moral authority same agent no, I don't I'm not feeling it you know like I, I get you but I, I, I prefer to do it this way because of this um it's the same as going out with a partial if you go out with like a proposal and three chapters and like here's the book I want to sell on the one hand that's very cool on the other hand you're opening up yourself up to a world where your editor is going to say so what if instead of being a uh, talking you know dragon your book starred a sad plumber and if you go to them with a completed manuscript you have some moral authority that's like no, no no this is this is the book you want me to change the book we can discuss that but now we're talking about you wanting me to change these hundred thousand words and you have more of a leg to stand on um but if it's like we haven't written the book yet well you're talking to me about what i'm going to do and i should be flexible and open to that so that kind of stuff um you know being able to say no apologetically is huge like you never have to give a hard no to people. And in fact, I find giving a hard no to people is really detrimental. Oftentimes a soft no. Yeah, that, that's a really interesting idea. I'm going to see if I can do that. That, that stands you in much better stead than almost anything. Um, but then the other thing, like just beyond, well, so in another nuts and bolts thing, I really wish I'd known. I wish I understood how to read a contract when I started. Like if you can't read a contract and understand what's going on, you need to learn because they're boring. And that's why you have someone else doing them for you, but you've got to know what they're saying. You've got to know it. And I'm still a little fuzzy on some things, but like you gotta have a basic understanding of what you're giving away. Cause that's yeah. your business. You gotta know how your business runs. Yeah, rights, rights. I mean, like you sell a short story and you have a very short contract and you know, first, first worldwide, world, yeah. worldwide rights. And you get the, you get the rights back in like six months. But a novel, yeah. completely different animal, and yeah, it's going to be so much more complex. And so, yeah, if you don't have an agent, you are kind of on your own trying to trying to figure, trying to go through that. So, do you find that you have? Um, I, I don't know if you have like a like a group of writers that are your 
sort of your people that you can go through, go to and talk to about that kind of stuff or that you did? Some, no, I did not at the time because no one wants to talk about their advances. No one wants to talk about the money. This is embarrassing. If you're making more than your friends or way less than your friends, it's embarrassing. Um, it's a metric of success rather than a metric of um, business. Like I have good contracts because I know what I'm doing. I've got people working for me, negotiating them who know what I'm doing, who know what they're doing. We know what we want. We're pretty aware of my value in the market. We have past experience and track record for that. But also we're finding people to negotiate with who are willing to come where we are. Like, do you know what I mean? Like what you get paid is a, is a result of what someone else is willing to pay you and the time you're in. And, and you're filling a need. You know, there are these things they send around um, every year or every now and then from like, it's like all the TV streaming networks and stations, televisions, all this stuff, like Peacock and Netflix and Hulu and all these, and what they're looking for. And oftentimes you land a really good contract because you're what they're looking for, not because you're a genius writer, but because you're a writer who's got what they want at that moment in time. Uh, and that's how you make your deals, you know? Um, and then the other thing I wanted, wanted to say about nuts and bolts is, so so I didn't have people talk to. Now I have people I can talk to where we're all like pretty, hey, do you know these guys? Like, what, you know, if, are they easy to work with? Did they do this in your contract? And two things about that is, yeah, I always try to be open. Like I give my contracts to people. Like I'm not gonna give them to anyone on this call, but like other writers <laughs> and stuff, they're like, can I see your contract? This? I'm like, sure, you're not going to steal my money. You're not stealing my work. Like, have it. Um, because we all get screwed. It's like a union. We all get screwed when we negotiate independently. When we negotiate as a group, we have some power and we're never going to be a group. There's never going to be really an author's union. Although I did just join SAG, or sorry, the WGA, the Writers Guild. Yeah. Holy crap, it's nice to have a union. But the other thing I was going to say is, Two things I wish other writers knew, and one thing I wish I'd known. One thing is, there's no such thing as a deal. Like, everything's open to negotiation. Like, a deal is really just a memo to make sure we both are on the same page about something. Man, you can break a contract. Your partner can break a contract. Anyone can break a contract. You just want to make sure you're both on the same page by getting it in writing. And you can always ask it. People say, this is our boilerplate. This is it. Take it or leave it you can always come in there and be like, yeah, I totally get it. But would it be huge if you did this? Like everything's up for negotiation. And they may say no, and that's part of the price, but you may as well ask. And then the other thing that I wish writers knew more is, you know, right now publishing is doing a really good thing, which is trying to be a lot more inclusive uh, in terms of gender, in terms of sexual identity, in terms of gender identity, in terms of ethnic identity and race and all this stuff. And that's amazing. Um, and I often hear about it being talked about from people like my point of view, which is I'm a white dude and you know it, it sucks because I'm not I'm getting passed over for work for like a black woman writer or you know it just it just, and you know and it can. I mean I, I've sat on calls where it's been like, okay, we need a black female showrunner or a gay. African American male showrunner. Like, you know, it's like, it's kind of like, it gets weird. It gets a little queasy. But if you flip that around, all of a sudden, the stuff that made writers not get jobs, their race, their gender, all this stuff is suddenly what is getting them jobs and actually getting them ahead in the line. And that's huge. That is amazing. And it's so nice to be alive during that. And I want to say to anyone, who is non-white, anyone who is not a dude, um, this is the moment to go for it. If you want to get into Hollywood, man, and you're a, a Black woman or a, Lat a Latina woman or a South Asian woman or a, a Asian dude, go. Just move there because the work is there. Um, I can't tell you how many projects I have log jammed um, because I'm, I really push hard to get female writers on and female showrunners, they're all booked up for, for years to come. And that reflects poorly on the industry because gosh, it would have been nice to build up a big bench of female talent instead of just ignoring them and treating like dog shit. And then suddenly 
there's this opportunity and but like this is the moment like honestly and it makes me so freaking excited for people I see I see a lot of um like calls for like open calls for for submissions for like short stories and stuff for anthologies and I'll read it and I'll think oh that's interesting and then it'll say you know we are looking specifically for like people in LGBTQ plus and BIPOC yeah. etc and I'm like cool that is not for me I'm moving on yeah and that's amazing and it's so wonderful to see everything opening up and so yeah you don't want to be that guy who then says oh why am I not getting this so yeah, yeah. and also I got to say you know quotas everything I mean there's a lot of talk that makes people feel guilty about this oh it's a quota oh they got the job because of you know their their gender or everything who the fuck cares because for a long time your gender or your race didn't get you the job you know what I mean like my wife is a chef which is a very male dominated field yeah. and she really firmly firmly believes that these awards that just are for women are what you have to do because the judging criteria are so designed to keep women out of a lot of these awards like Michelin stars and things like that that she's like yeah for now as a transitional thing, let's have women on, let's say Michelin has to give one to a woman for every dude, because it's so biased the other way. And there has to be a balancing and you can't balance by going to this side and then the middle, you gotta balance by going to this side, then that side, then eventually you get to the middle. Um, so yeah, anyways, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so you've talked about like contract basics, about needing some business sense representation. Um, so, I'm gonna before before we get to the the, the big circle back. I'm gonna I am gonna ask one question. Um, the best if you had to pick one single piece of advice for new writers, what would it be? One single advice for new. Oh yeah, one single piece of advice. Man, well the big thing I always say to people is figure out why you're writing. Like if you can figure that out without lying to yourself or trying to make it sound acceptable or whatever. If you're writing for money, if you wanna write for the market, do that. If you wanna write because you've got a really specific story that you wanna share about yourself or your family or something that happened to you, do that. Um, if you're writing to entertain, do that. You know, in the, in the early nineties, when I moved to New York, I, uh, I started working with this theater company that was mostly gay and trans uh, performers, drag queens, all that. And, um, the trans just makes it sound like we were a serious company and we weren't, but they were doing like they only did, they were called Tweed and they did these really experimental multimedia works. And um, it was pretty unforgiving stuff. And as I moved in, it was early nights, it was sort of like the, the, the end of the big wave, wave of AIDS that they really wiped out theater. And a lot of people that we had worked with, this company had worked with and all that. and um, the guy who ran the company came in one day. It's like, we're doing comedies. We're doing comedies here on out. It's comedy because too many people are dead and people just want to go and laugh and have a nice time. And so for the next, I would say, God, 15 years, we just did comedies and we did great ones. We did amazing stuff that I'm so proud to have worked on. And the entire goal of every single one of those shows was to make people have the best night out they could. And we knew what we were doing and why it wasn't deep. It wasn't, but we, it was so fulfilling to be like, we knew what we were doing and why. And so it was like everything we did, like I did a lot of sound work, a lot of video work for them. It'd be like, we'd be shooting a video and be like, is there a funnier joke here? Can they step in dog shit? Can they fall down a hill? Like, what can we do to just add it? Cause we knew that we had one mandate, which was just be funny. And so as a writer, you've got to understand what is your, what are you doing this for? And once you do, that's what you do over and over again. And everything else is extraneous. If you're writing to entertain people, then that's what your books have to be entertaining. And that's, a, do I, hmm, does this character do this or this? Well, which is the more entertaining solution? If you're writing books, because you really believe that, um, rats have been really oppressed and you need to speak for rats and show people that rats aren't just crappy animals but actually a really functional member of the ecosystem who, who is in fact more entitled to be on this planet than we are then you really really need to like every decision will have to be about how to make those rats look better um you figure out why you're doing it and then do that rather than running around trying to do a million different things so it looks like then the success that you found has been a combination of 
knowing what you want, like, you know, having an idea and, and, and knowing what your goal is and taking advantage of opportunities and accidentally, organically growing your career because of, you know, taking chances. This opportunity opens up, you say, okay, I'm going to take it, but you still, you know, knew that you wanted to write things that you really enjoyed. And, and so I think that brings us sort of back to the beginning of your talk, back to the Nazi leprechauns in a sense. Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny because talking about this stuff, I'm like, oh yeah, I basically wound up writing. And a lot of times I'll say that I said to people when I was working, like, I mean, I had a huge freak out years ago um, because I was like, oh my God, this writing thing isn't going well. It's not working out. I'm not paying the bills and I don't know how to do anything else. And I'm 43 years old. Like I can't go back to law. It's too late for me. And looking at it, I'm like, oh, I very cannily just cut off all my options until that was all I could do. So accident on purpose, you know, are you mess? Are you, are you gaslighting yourself? But one of the things I, you know, in, in the accident part is, so this, this, this book, The Little People, when I, when I came across it, like, I was at a convention called ReaderCon, which is not a big convention. And I was there, it was like gone to Clary. And I'd gone to Clarion because I needed to do something because there was no more freelance work. And I went to ReaderCon because all my friends from Clarion were there. And I was going through dealer boxes, like just under a, a table of a guy selling books. And these were his dollar bins. And I found that book. And I was like, this is amazing. And I was like, I'm going to read it. And it was amazing. I just bought it for the cover, but then I read it. And then I wrote about it. And then it led to Paperbacks from Hell, which led to a story, which led to so much more stuff for me. But one of the things about that, that, that sort of path of accidents is it's a path of accidents, but it's always accidents. Like your whole life is an accident. Like who right now is exactly where they thought they were going to be 10 years ago. And, and doing that, that led me to, you know, this thing where I did When Darkness Loves Us and started doing these books with Valancourt and led me to things like Hellhound by Ken Greenhall, which my life would be poor if I hadn't read <laughs> Ken Greenhall. He is probably one of the, except for Michael McDowell, maybe one of the great paperback writers. And he was always a failure. He never went far. But doing that, and when I started doing Paperbacks from Hell, all of Ken's books were out of print and, and Ken had passed away. And all of his books, every single one of them, except his last one, which I would love to get back into print, but it's a historical fiction novel. It's amazing, called Lenore. It's hard, it's hard sell though. They're all in print now. And his widow, Agnes, is, is making money off of them. And I, I, I know Agnes a little bit. And, and it's this huge thing for her that Ken's moment came around. And, um, you know, we brought back into print The Auctioneer by Joan Sampson. And I met her widower, um, Warren and Warren Carsberg and all his life, she had written this book that was a huge hit when it came out and she died of brain cancer about three months later. And this amazing career was cut off and he's lived with that all his life and her book just disappearing. And we were able to like bring this back. And it's one of those things that's meant the world to me. And it's one of those things that led me finally to the cats. Um, which is a British book about, it's like the rats, but it's cats uh, written around the same time, killer cats storm, storming across England, rampaging through, through you know, um, the, the green hills of that fair and pleasant land, uh, written by Nick Sharman, whose actual name is Scott Gronmark, who worked for the BBC for many years. And I, and I met Scott doing this and interviewed him a few times. And, and we became friends and correspondents. And Scott, was such a good guy. And he, he passed away in 2020. And, and I still have his last email to me, which I mean, which I still haven't opened um, because I don't want to. But people like Scott and Agnes and Warren, I think about them all the time. And I only know them. These are people who didn't make my career better, but they were people I was able to do something for, but then they did a lot more for me knowing them. And I don't have that unless I found that book of Nazi leprechauns, unless I had gone to ReaderCon, which was unless I went to Clarion, which was unless every other job died, which was, it's just a chain of accidents and you just keep following it. And you don't wind up having a career, you wind up having a life, right? They're not two different things. They're hopefully the same. 
That is an amazing note to, to, to segue now on to opening up for questions um, from the audience. And as we wait for people to, you can type it in the chat. If you want to unmute and um, turn your video on, you can. If you just want to unmute yourself, you can. Um, please, if you have questions, by all means. Oh yeah, and ask anything. I'm not. I'm not shy. I'll. I'll answer anything. I think. I think we figured that out by now. <laughs> um, while we wait, um, so uh, I can ask a question while we wait. So this will give people a minute to think about things. Is there any other genre you'd like to tackle? Oh yeah, well you know it's funny. I thought it was the same genre because you kind of just write the books you write, and people are like, oh, this is this. We'll shelve it here, and eventually you figure out where you're getting shelving up there. But there's a there's a novel about 19th century mediums that um, I've been wanting to write for years and years and years, and it's a horror novel. But no one wants me to write it because it's historical fiction, and I'm like, dude. All my books are historical fiction. Best Friends Exorcism is set in 88. Like uh, We Sold Our Souls is set in 2009. Um, you know, uh, and, uh, Mom's Book Club's uh, Vampires is mm. set in the 90s. Um, yeah. even, even Final Girl Support Group set in 2010. Um, and, but people are like, no, 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 historical fiction. And they, what they mean is like Merchant Ivory, Downton Abbey kind of stuff. Um, and I'm like, oh. Um, but people love but that. Yeah, like so they're, it's, it's out there. So why, you know, it's interesting. Yeah. Like you can't, you can't sell them on it because historical fantasy is like huge right now. I know, but it's you know, once you get to a certain point career-wise, you can take risks. Like I have a back catalog that sells that lets me take risks. At the same time, who wants to be the person who lets me take that risk? And what if no one follows me to that book? So I get it. Yeah. Um, so Nick has a question. Uh, says, I'm trying to write a male protagonist view. So the point you made about making things more interesting, think uh, writing about your POV was great. What other tips do you have for writing about not what you might know? And then I, I like the, I am female. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, yeah. I mean, here's the thing. So writing women, um, I have three older sisters. A lot of my friends are women. Not to be a bop. Um, but there's sort of two things that I've learned about writing people who aren't the same gender as me. One is they're just people. Um, they pretty much do the same stuff I do. Like 90% of a woman's time is consists of basically living the life I live. Eat, shit, sleeps, you know, music. And, and interactions get different because of gender and things like that and perceived gender and all that. And, 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 and you know, it's it's me walking down a, a street in the middle of the night with no one on it at two in the morning. It's going to be a very different experience for a woman walking down that street at two in the morning. But that's just listening to people, you know, and and hearing them. And one of the big things I realized is, and and I'll try to keep this brief because I've told this story before, and I don't want to be that guy who tells the same story over and over. But I wrote the first draft of my best friend's exorcism. Actually, it was like the second draft, and it, it was a pretty hot book. Like it actually like. If I could have pulled that book off, it'd be so much better than the book I wound up writing. Um, I just wasn't a good enough writer to do it. But um, I, I gave it to my wife to read and she's like, this is a lot of garbage. Uh, and it was a finished manuscript. So that was pretty irritating. Um, and what I realized though is she was right. And I spent a lot of time and I was like, I was recycling John Hughes cliches about high school. I was writing about teen, teenagers based on having written YA about teenagers, myself. I'm not trying to insult any YA, like I'm insulting my own attempts at YA. Um, and what I realized was, I went back to all the old photographs and yearbooks and letters and diaries and read them. And it painted a really different picture than what all this stuff has been codified into with geeks and jocks and cheerleaders and mean girls. It's, that's not real life. In real life, the geeks, geeks were the jocks who were often the mean girls who actually were kind of nice and were mostly scared, but also kind of bitches too sometimes. Like, and so the two things I've really realized about writing is a, a, a character is one is um, I got to go to people. I talk to people. I don't read stuff anymore unless it's nonfiction. And even then I try to talk to real people. Like I, it's just, it's, it's so much more interesting and different from what you're gonna see in movies or on TV or other books even. Like you've gotta look at real people and talk to real people and try to understand them and figure out and listen to what they have to say to you and try to understand why, like that person's saying that, that makes no sense. 
Like I come from a, a relatively conservative family in South Carolina. So I spent a lot of my childhood trying to understand the point of view of my cousins. And so, and doing that Confederate flag documentary was like helpful. Like I just had to listen to people and try to hear why they were saying that. But then the other thing I do want to say is, and this is kind of about writing about people different. You, the only thing you have to sell is yourself and like your experience in the world and your attention. And it is so hard to focus on things, man. I can go home and watch Squid Games. Dude, that thing is so fucking well produced. It is so good. Why am I writing anything? I could be watching that. I could be having sex. I could be, <laughs> you know, listening to a rad fucking band. I could be doing, I could be doing, I could be high. I could be doing so many more fun things than writing. Um, but if I'm writing, I gotta focus. My attention span, an unbroken attention span is huge. And I use everything, man. I use internet blockers. I turn my phone off. I write hand. I do anything to keep my butt in my chair and keep myself focused. Because the one thing I've realized is my first ideas about stuff suck. And it's only after I get past a few of those that it works. Like this book I've got coming out next summer that I just turned in. I should have turned, I turned in a draft of this in October. That draft was wrong, wrong, wrong. And even that was late. And the next one was a whole different version of the book that I turned in simmer and that sucked. And I just turned in the one that's the first version of what's gonna be the good one. You gotta keep throwing stuff out because you gotta keep focusing. You gotta keep going deeper. And that means you gotta concentrate. Yeah. Concentrating so hard. Um, so Karina asks, um, I'd like to ask if you have seen examples of YA and adult novels where they included illustrations and what your opinion is on illustrated adult fiction. I dare about writing and illustrating my own series, my own story series, and I know it's challenging, but I have the confidence it can be done. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, listen, illustrated books used to be a thing, right? Like um, Beardsley, all these, they were, yeah. Um, I, I think it's just finding a way to do it that looks new. Um, and, and, and to make sense, like the first re thing people ask when you're pitching a graphic novel and or an illustrated book, I'm sure, is why does this need to be illustrated? Like they want to know why they need to do something different. Um, and you've got to have a really compelling reason for that. But, you know, think of Edward Gorey. He's an illustrator for adults who illustrates books, who is a genius. And those books don't exist without the illustrations because uh, they stand in contrast to each other. And one of the fights I have a lot are not fights, um, heated Conversation. conversations I have a lot, is uh, with, with editors and stuff, is finding a cover where there's like a good cover having tension on it, like between the title and the image, right? If, if the title is my fucking radical cat orgy, then probably the best cover for that is just a picture of a pretty little kitty cat because you've got a lot of attention between this kind of out there title and this very sedate image. Now, if your title is, you know, cats, then what you want on that cover is a cat fucking ripping a dude. So you wanna have that tension and it's, those are extreme examples, but you wanna find stuff that has that in there. Um, and so that's what I think you have to find is what's the tension between the illustrations and the text with Gory, you know, he found it. Um, yeah, exactly. Making the reader ask what is going on here and focusing on both rather than ignoring one and going to the other. You know, Elmore Leonard said this famous thing about writing that again sounds stupid, but it's actually kind of profound, is don't write the parts readers skip. And he's right, because often you write that stuff because it gets you where you need to be as a writer for that chapter or whatever, but the reader doesn't need it. I can't tell you how many experimental chapters I've had in books that wind up just being totally normal, straightforward chapters when they get printed. But I needed that to get me to write that chapter and to engage with it. Yeah, it, I remember Liz Han saying, don't write the boring stuff. <laughs> it's one yeah, of those things exactly. that came in my head. <clears throat> and, and like, it, if you write, you you write, you get it out of your system and then you can edit it. Yeah. You just need to get and that's it out of your system. I, and that's what I mean, like these three drafts of this book, it took me two full drafts before I got everything I wanted to do that was cool out of my system to actually focus on what the book actually was and what I could do. Um, and the other thing I would say just uh, to whoever it is who was saying about the illustrated books, one of the big issues right now is finding a publisher for something like that. Because a lot of 
art departments and art directors are not what they used to be. So finding editors who get that kind of visual literacy, I'm not saying they're idiots, but it's it's tougher. That's that's something that the industry attracts, has less of a call for. So you really have to land somewhere that does that or find someone who's exceptional, who, who can see that. Yeah. Um. So Niffy, I think it is. What's the weirdest thing that's happened to you that has made it into one of your books, if I may ask? Man, I don't know. Um, I'm trying to think of weird, weird things that have happened to me. Um, man, what's the weirdest? Um, none of it seems weird. <laughs> <laughs> it all seems really normal. Um, oh, um, man, because it's usually the really banal stuff that makes it into the books. You know, yeah. like, like I, I, I lived in my car for a little while, and. Um, and, and was living on the roof of a Chinese restaurant at one point in Key West, Florida, and found like a, a dead body that had been left in the sun for so long and it sort of cooked. And um, on the roof, on the roof of the no, restaurant? No, 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 it was in a, I was living on the roof. But you know, I, I was taking a shortcut through a cemetery and this dude had just like, I think had a heart attack and just, it was like 101 degree weather and he just like baked. Um, and so like, you would think that found it in the books, never has, nothing ever, ever has. <laughs> However, my experience of having to sit at the table with my grandmother who had Alzheimer's and eat dinner with her night after night has made it into books. And in my experience of like driving to school has made it into so many books. Um, mm -hmm. like, like all the banal stuff makes it into books and gets juicy. It's the weird stuff that never really does. Like, you know, I, yeah. Where are you gonna fit it? It's, it's it's so it's a, it's almost like even in your life it's it's its own little like silo of stuff because you think about so much other weird stuff you're like I don't even need that. Yeah, it's, exactly. Um, let's see. Um, Demi says hi, Grady. <clears throat> First of all, thank you for your novels. Uh, my welcome. best friend's exorcism broke me out of a serious reading block, and I finished it in one sitting when I got it as a gift. That's awesome. Thank you. Secondly, I was wondering whether the time periods you choose to set your books in are deliberate, like setting uh, Best Friends Exorcism Satanic Panic against the same period as the Cold War, for example, or whether it just happens organically. Yeah, both. Well, your description of all your novels as a form yeah. of historical fiction got me thinking. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so both. So I really deliberately wanted to set my Best Friends Exorcism in the 80s for a very practical reason, which was there's been twice in my career where I've had a title that gave me everything I needed. And one of those was my best friend's act. I had the title before I had the story. And it was a good title. I mean, they bought it based on, Quirk bought it based on the title and a rough idea of what it would be about. Two best friends, exorcism, all right there in the title. Took me a long time to get to the book. But but so then I was like, okay, so I need a, I need, I'm writing an exorcism book and it's about friends. And I need something in there that besides religious faith, that's gonna drive an exorcism. Well, okay, it's kind of in the title. It's going to be friendship. That's something people have faith and believe in, and many people are less religious than they were in the '70s when The Exorcist came out. You know, in terms of organized religion, so great friendship. When's friendship the most powerful? High school, no, no doubt. That's when mine were most powerful. Okay, I can't write about contemporary high school. I don't, I don't know vaping and cell phones and active shooters and all this stuff, but I know my high school, and that was in the '80s. And then I started looking at old um, yearbooks. And I don't know if people do this in, in, uh, in uh, the UK, but like, you know, you write the have a great summer crap inside the cover of your friend's yearbooks. And I noticed that in 10th grade, it went from cool to sit next to you in history to these epic things full of inside jokes. I was like, 10th grade, that seems to be when like you develop a personality. And so I was like, okay, my 10th grade was 88. That's what I'm gonna set it, Satanic Panic, Cold War, all that stuff to make use of. And it turned out to be really, because then you get into the coincidences, like you're like, oh, Satanic Panic, Cold War, all that stuff. Also, um, music was like at its, some of its most interesting at that time. You know, you know 80s music, it was so many genres were going mainstream. Um, you also had, uh, I started talking to teachers I knew and they were like, oh yeah, 10th grade, man. I don't want to be around 10th grade. I was like, okay, I lucked into that. But like um, uh, Southern Book Club, I knew I wanted to set something in that neighborhood a few years after my best friend's exorcism, same neighborhood. So 88 to 93, that made sense. And then I started, I was like, okay, what about the 90s? And really went deep on the 90s and realized there was so much stuff there that sort of made it into the book. But it was kind of like, I want to do a book here. 
And then taking that decision seriously, what does it mean to be in 1993, to be in the 90s, beyond fashion and clothes and music? What does it mean? What does that feel like? So there are choices that get made sort of artistically, uh, but then I, you know, one of the things you have to do is take those choices super seriously and like follow them to their logical conclusions once you make them, which is often a pain in the ass. That's the fun thing about writing history do all this research and yeah it's fun to look at the clothes and the furniture and all that but it's you know those little things those little references those little things like I was a kid in the 80s and so I can I was a teenager in the 80s and went to high school in the 80s and so all I have to say to you is like where were you when the wall fell we know yeah know? exactly yeah we know what we, we already know what we were wearing but it's those cultural things those those moments yeah. of recognition of of um what the world was like and that's a little bit harder to get sometimes from all the research. And then when you hit that, that's when things are really on. Yeah. So like, so I'm doing this book, How to Sell a Haunted House. And um, and so there's a moment in it where someone tells a story about joining a radical public collective, which I belong to in the 90s or the 2000s. And, um, and it's based a little on my experience. It's a long story. And it's like a story. And, and I'm like, God, you know, this isn't clicking. Like he's in this radical puppet collective in 2002. I was in it in the 90s, a little earlier. And, and I was like, it's not, it's not where, and then I was like, what does that mean 2000? I was like, oh shit, 9-11. And I was like, and I realized that when I was in this puppet collective, it had just been the first Gulf War. And we really, really were trying to stop a war from happening again. And as cheesy as it sounds, we really believed in it. And I was like, yeah, of course, 2002. And so I gave him this moment where he really talked about the shit we believed in, that like we thought there was this chance to like stop this, to yeah. keep people from being killed, to really turn this ship around. And it didn't work out. And suddenly this whole chapter that had been this sort of goofy thing was like, oh, this guy actually like, he really believed in something. And even worse, he had to see that he was wrong. Not just he was wrong, he was right. They could have stopped the war, but they didn't. And thousands and thousands of people died. And he's had to live with that. This is very personal. And I was, so it's like taking those choices seriously and really getting yeah. to the bottom of them is harder than it sounds, but you kind of got to. That's the thing. Okay, one last question, because we're, we're running out of time. Um, so Esther has a question. Do you give yourself a deadline for research if you do any? She says, I tend to get happily bogged down with research that stops me writing. Yeah, that's a question for your therapist because, <laughs> you know, because you're finding reasons not to write. And like, I, yeah. I do it all the time. I do it all the time. I call it research or I call it I'm too busy or I call it I feel like crap or I call it I'm giving myself a day off or whatever it is. But I'm, I'm looking for excuses. Not to, and then I got to be like, why aren't I writing? Am I bored with it? Like, what do I do to make it? Because I don't have to write for a living. I get to write for a living, yeah. which is like, so why am I having, why do I not want to do it? This is what I love. Um, and so, but yeah, with research, I do it all the way through. Um, and in fact, oftentimes some of the, and like, I, I, I try to load up the ship with a ton of fuel at the beginning. So it's like, if I'm writing and writing, like just now on this book, I was writing and writing and I was like, oh God, I need a name for a puppet. And I was like, I had all these puppet names from the 50s and 60s children show. I could go oh, they're, they're, and get some inspiration for that. I didn't have to dig for it. I had it there. Um, but there's also like, I had to make a huge change in the book um, with, with, with stuff at the last minute. And I was like, okay. And I just started doing research again in the moment. So I do it all the way to the end, but I try to load up and, and two thirds of the stuff I load up with at the beginning, I never use. And if I start trying to jam it in, I screw up my book. So yeah. it's knowing what to use and what not to use, but, but getting you there. But, but it's also just about, you know, one of the things I have, and I used to keep these digitally and then my, my calendar app crash. Um, but, but I have these, these calendars with this and it's a work journal and it goes back four years and it's my word count every day what I worked on because it's so easy to think oh I had a really good day and be like dude I wrote 2,000 words what 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 am I doing with my time <laughs> and like to look back and, and it's like a bio feedback thing the more you have to hold yourself to that the more you get done um for me yeah this has been astoundingly interesting um and, and before, before we say goodbye, 
plug what's next for you. What's coming out next? Hmm. Well, so I just have a nonfiction book come out in the States and we're still negotiating the contract for the UK with, um, which I think we're going to do, but it's called Beast Fist Break Bricks. Uh, it's a history of um, Kung Fu movies coming to America and the West. Um, and it, man, it's sort of like paperbacks from hell, but for Kung Fu movies. But it was, I'm really, I wrote this with a guy named Chris Bajali, who's an incredible researcher. And um, we, there's everything in here from the CIA backing karate movies in secret to root out communists in the Japanese film industry to an 11 year old kid who made a Bruce Lee exploitation movie that became a worldwide hit to just, we found so much wild stuff. Um, and That's porn amazing. barons backing Kung Fu movies. <laughs> I mean, just most the weirdest things. Um, and that, so that should hopefully be out in the UK in a little bit. And then Final Girl Support Groups out in paperback later this summer. And then, but the big thing is how to sell a haunted house, which is coming out in July in the US and UK. I wish I had a cover image to sell or show you guys, but it's not locked yet. It's way behind, but it's it's a haunted house book, but it's also about killer puppets. So I'm trying to thread that needle, haunted houses and puppets, you know? Well, if you send me an image, I can share it with class when I teach. So whoever was, because a couple of students I see here, so I can say, hey, here's whatever. Thank you so much. This has been um, entertaining and educational and just so much fun to hang out and chat with you and talk about all the things. Um, thank you for joining us. Thank no, you everybody. Thanks for having Thank y'all so much for being here. Um, and I appreciate you guys like asking questions and uh, doing participating and inviting me in the first place. And it's good to see you too. Yeah, Sorry, you I'm too. not gonna see you in March. I know, hopefully, hopefully the convention will happen later in the year. I can see you then. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, everybody for tuning in. Um, this has been AHSS Presents a Conversation with Grady Hendrix. Keep tuned for our next AHSS Presents. We'll see you on, we'll see you soon. Bye. Bye y'all, thanks.